Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, please be welcome to the uh, Planning Appeals training session with the DPA on Thursday, the 14th of December, 2023. I will just go through today's agenda with you. Uh, to begin with today, we will receive an introduction to the DPA by Scott Berry, the Chief Reporter. Following that, uh, we'll get an overview of how the appeals process works by two reporters, Elspeth Cook and Sinead Lynch. And then we will get perspectives from planning authorities by Gillian Cyprus, the principal planner at West Holding Council, and appeals from Elaine Parkers and Black at Brodie's. There'll be a short amount of time for questions during a panel discussion. And finally, we'll look at areas where we can deliver future training. Uh, we'll just pass over now to Scott Ferry, the Chief Reporter at the DPA. So, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many attendees at this first uh, session of uh, what we intend to be a series of uh, training events um, provided by us here in DPA in, in conjunction with um, Trevor Moffat at the Improvement Service. So, this one, by its nature, will, will be um, a very general introduction to the work of, of DPA and our intention is very much that we will drill down into more topics in depth as uh, we move through 2024. And David Little will talk about that um, towards the end of this afternoon's session um, and will um, canvas you for suggestions for more in-depth training. Um, so, looking at the work of the Planning and Environmental Appeals Decision, um, we are a division of Scottish Government. We sit within the Directorate for Legal Services, but um, it's very important that we are a distinct part of Scottish Government and um, independent from other parts, no, not least because um, we will, from time to time, examine proposals that come to us from other divisions of Scottish Government. And it's well understood within Scottish Government that, that um, we are very um, separate and independent from those other divisions. So our main role is to organise and conduct appeals and examinations on behalf of the ministers. Um, and in doing so, we uh, must always apply the principles of natural justice. So that's um, fairness, transparency and impartiality in everything that we do in casework. Um, there are various provisions in legislation for uh, appeals to Scottish ministers, and we tend to take all of those that um, are remotely related to planning or the environment. Um, so as I said there, we, we determine appeals on behalf of Scottish ministers, um, understandably, given that we receive hundreds of appeals each year, not all of those will be considered directly by the planning minister or our ministers themselves. Um, and the vast majority of what we deal with is delegated to the individual reporter. Uh, we will make the uh, decision on behalf of ministers. There's a separate minute of appointment from the minister to each reporter reporter on a case by case basis. On other cases, the reporter will be appointed to report to the minister, making recommendations um, as to whether the minister should um, approve or refuse the proposal or the scheme or the order or whatever it happens to be. Um, those are called recalled appeals and um, called in applications. Um, Reporters will um, also examine and report to uh, ministers on proposed development plans. They'll report to planning authorities on, on, on proposed LDPs. Um, and uh, we're very much looking forward to accepting our first gate check reviews of evidence reports, um, which is a new innovation and which will uh, kick in. Um, we expect to be receiving the first of those gate check reviews um, round about March, April time of next year. Um, in addition to that, we um, process a wide range of non-planning casework, um, and I'll come on to that a bit later in the presentation. So just thinking about the DPA structure, there's the chief reporter, that's me. I have um, three assistant chief reporters, David Liddell, Karen Haywood and Alison Cord, and um, we, we have 
26 salaried reporters who are Scottish Government Civil Service. And in addition to that, to help us deal with peaks and troughs and casework, we have 16 consultant reporters, uh, also called self-employed reporters. In parallel to that, we have a, a head of performance and administration, David Henderson, who I would imagine's name is familiar to, to many of you, and he manages a casework team of uh, 17 and a finance and IT team, IT team of uh, six civil servants. Um, so who, who are reporters? We're, we're mostly planners. Um, some are lawyers. We have an ecologist, an environmental assessment specialist. We don't currently, but have in the past, had uh, architects, and, and that's a um, uh, uh, skill that we very much hope to reintroduce back into DPA when when um, we, we can manage to do that. Um, reporters come from both the, the private and the public sectors. Um, as I said earlier, uh, reporters appointed uh, separately to each case and, and there's a minute of appointment lying on each case file. That, that's quite an important distinction to make. They aren't just um, allocated to a case um, on an ad hoc basis by me. Um, there's no hierarchy of decision making in, in DPA. So, you know, contrary to what might be the experience um, in, in planning authorities, for example, where uh, cases will work their way through a hierarchy of decision making, the reporters very much appointed to um, make a decision or report to ministers on a personal basis. Um, so they, they, in doing that, they have to be objective, independent, exercise their own planning judgment. And um, I would never seek to uh, substitute my or any of our managers planning judgment for that of the um, appointed reporter. But having said that, um, we need to ensure quality and consistency in decision makings. And it, it's natural that um, appellants and other um, interested parties would expect these decisions to be being made on behalf of Scottish ministers to be consistent with each other. So that, that's very much um, one of the key activities of, of me and the assistant uh, chief reporters. Um, in terms of the administration team, there's a nice photograph of um, the administration team. It's a bit, bit old now and some of those folks aren't there, but it will give you an idea of uh, the numbers um, that we have there. So as I've said, 24 employees, um, most are case workers and you'll see their name on our case management system um, against each appeal and they're very much um, participants main point of contact and in individual appeals. They're very accessible by email and by telephone um, and in our experience they, they provide a fantastic level of service um, to participants. If ever you're in doubt about anything around your um, case, um, just get in touch with the case worker and uh, they are definitely there to help and to provide advice. Um, there are team leaders within that casework team. We also have a small finance and IT team. One of their functions is to webcast hearings, inquiries and pre-examination meetings, and that happens both virtually and um, remotely, but also they will go out where we can and where resources allow um, with their equipment to webcast in-person hearings and inquiries. Um, thinking about our work, um, in 2022-23, we um, processed 625 cases, 503 of those were appeal cases. On an average month, we would have around 220 cases on hand, so live cases um, allocated to reporters. That number's definitely dipped of late and I think has followed on from a dip in planning applications and, and related applications to planning authorities. I think we're, we're sitting at around 180, 190 on hand at present, um, which is um, a bit out of the ordinary, it's good to be said, um, over the, the course of the last few years. And most of those um, cases are planning appeals and um, related planning um, cases. 
um, the main types of appeals that we're dealing with, housing development, obviously, both major and minor. A lot of cases um, around exceptional release housing sites. Um, most folk will know that we, we've got 17 or 18 of those on hold on CIST at the minute, pending um, a judgment in the Miller Homes case. So our, our activity on those cases has uh, been a bit quiet over the last few months. Um, wind farms, onshore wind farms, um, together with transmission lines for, for electricity transmission, short term wet, uh, a very um, topical type of case at the minute. We, we're expecting um, following the introduction of short term wet licensing schemes um, to be receiving um, a huge um, uptick in appeals related to short term wet both planning appeals, certificate of lawful use appeals and um, enforcement appeals around that use. Um, moving on, planning conditions and obligations are also, be able, are also able to be appealed to DPEA. Um, obligations appeals can be very tricky, um, so they, they, they tend to, to uh, be allocated to more senior, more experienced um, reporters. And as you can see there, enforcement appeals, listed building consent appeals and um, certificates of lawfulness. Um, other types of casework, um, I've mentioned development plan examinations and gate checks. Um, although there are not many of those typically with us, maybe um, a handful of, of examinations at most on the go at any one time, they are very resource intensive for us. So we, we would tend to have a, at least one, perhaps a, a team of reporters, up to three or four reporters on each of those examinations at any one time. Um, and they, they can take six months to nine months up to a year in the most complex um, examples of those. Um, gate checks, I've mentioned earlier, um, we're very much in suck it and see mode on that. We're working closely with planning authorities who are preparing their evidence reports, not commenting on the evidence reports that they're working on, but trying to get both them and us ready for the gate check reviews, which will inevitably follow. Um, <coughs> Electricity Act cases, um, another um, case flow that we, we don't have huge numbers of, but again are hugely resource intensive. So a Section 36 wind farm or a Section 37 um, transmission line, we'd typically take a reporter um, around a year. Our, our target for dealing with those is uh, 50 weeks and um, that that would be um, a typical amount taken. Um, so again, very resource um, intensive draw on reporters. Other sort of miscellaneous types of casework that we regularly deal with, compulsory purchase orders under the Planning Act, under the Housing Act, um, uh, Roads Acts as well, often bring with roads orders CPOs, um, high hedge appeals, code path plans. We haven't seen so many of those over the last few years. Um, community asset transfers. There's a steady stream um, of, of those types of case. They often will entail um, a hearing just to ensure that, that parties um, are able to get their case uh, over to the reporter and environmental appeals there. So things coming to us following on from decisions of SEPA, um, also um, Scottish Water and related appeals. Um, just some examples there of current and recent casework. So we're, we're currently examining the City of Edinburgh proposed LDP, that examination, and I think there have been perhaps four or five reporters on that is, is coming towards an end. We expect to report back to the City Council in February of next year on that, and that will be the last of our examinations into the so-called old style LDPs, and we'll immediately move from that onto the uh, next generation LDPs, um, dealing first of all with the gate check reviews. Um, two significant transmission line proposals, one in Dumfries and Galloway and the other in Argyll. Um, one's complete, the other's moving towards completion. 
in speaking to uh, transmission undertakers, we expect that to be uh, another significant draw on our resources over the next two to three years, where I think we're, we're, we're being advised that we might face um, maybe four or five Bewley to Denny scale inquiries. So that's something that we're very much gearing ourselves up for. Um, Roads orders and CPOs, the A9 duelling and the Sheriff Hall roundabout being recent examples of those um, exceptional release housing sites that I mentioned a little earlier, um, not least the Miller Homes um, appeal at West Calder and West Lothian, which um, will be at the inner house um, towards the end of January. And something a bit different, the Royal High School redevelopment, which was a, a significant um, proposal affecting a Category A listed building. Um, in terms of performance against targets, we are at the minute um, performing very highly against targets. You can see in that fourth column that um, our ministerial target is that we deal with uh, each of these categories of planning appeals. Um, to a, an 80 percent target. So in other words, looking at site inspection cases, which is the the, the busiest uh, row there in the table, um, the ministers expect us to deal with uh, 80 percent of those cases within a 12 week period. Um, and as you can see, there were, were up at 91 percent currently. Um, that, that's due to a lot of improvement activity that, that we've undertaken. It's also due to the ability of uh, drawing on our self-employed reporter cohort to help us um, deal with um, peaks and troughs. As, as you can imagine, we're very much demand led. We, we can't control the flow of cases to us, so we, we need to be really flexible um, in deploying reporters and case workers for that matter um, to help us continue to meet targets even in um, busy times. Um, and finally, um, from me, um, you can see there um, the front cover of our annual review. We're required to publish an annual review each year, usually around June time, just following on from the end of the financial year. And there is a link on the screen there. Um, really, my talk uh, this afternoon has been a paraphrasing of, of information that's in that annual review. Um, and if you're um, at all interested in, in reading a bit more about what we do, um, you would find uh, more information information in there. So that, that's it from me. Um, before handing on to the next speakers, uh, just to reiterate that we very much are up for continuing a series of training sessions and uh, David will speak to the end about um, just identifying what sort of training it is that you would be interested in. Um, but thanks for me for the moment. Um, I'm Elspeth Cook. I've been a reporter for just over six years now. Um, before that, my background was in local authority development management. Um, I'm going to talk about the appeal process uh, as it's set out in those yellow boxes on the, the slide in front of you, which is essentially about the submission of information up to the point where the reporter starts to think about the case. There are um, four or five key elements to that, and I'm just going to deal with each one of those in turn. But I'll start perhaps first just looking at the nature of an appeal, because so, like, for those of you, and I know there's a sort of cross section of people are here today listening in, some have lots of experience, some have none. Um, an appeal is, is a set, it's a statutory right, it's embedded in the relevant planning acts and, and similar acts uh, for listed building and conservation area matters. Um, the process itself is set out in the appeal regulations that date from 2013, and those are accompanied by a circular uh, circular 4 of 2013 that provides a bit more guidance. Now, you'll be relieved I'm not going to actually talk you through stage by th stage through those, uh, those guidelines. Uh, they're there, you can go and read them and have a proper look at them. The circular itself is particularly helpful if you're trying to understand the purpose of each of the stages. But it was important that you understand this regulatory framework because it dictates so much of what we do. Um, and it's not just that we're making something up uh, as we go along. It might seem that way, but that's actually not what's happening. Uh, the first important thing to remember about appeal is that it's de novo, the Latin phrase. We're dealing with it afresh and a new, um, um, we're going to look at everything again. So very much the information we're looking for 
is going to cover both positive and uh, elements and the areas in dispute. Um, but the decision itself is always going to centre on the grounds of appeal and those areas of dispute, um, because that's really what the appellant's looking for out of the process. But of course, remember, if we do happen to grant planning permission at the end of this, we need to understand all the positive elements of the proposal and not just the areas where, where there's been uh, issues uh, with compliance with policy, for example. And the next thing to remember, if you've not done a, an appeal recently or you've never done an appeal before, is that it's very much evidence orientated. Um, the information that you rely on to express your view for or against the proposal should be fully supported by relevant documents, uh, technical reports, uh, guidance, whatever you think you use to make your decision, you need to pass that on to us and it becomes part of the, the case evidence that the reporter is going to look at. Um, I see a lot of tense emails from time to time regarding that issue. And, and I really want to sort of say um, the DPA staff and the reporters are not unwilling or unable to search the internet to find a relevant policy document. It's just that we're not supposed to. Um, whatever you want us to consider, you have to provide to us. I'm going to come back to that in this issue of evidence, and I think it, it's Sinead's going to touch on it as well, is that that's really a fundamental part of this process. And if you take nothing else away from today, it's understanding how important it is to provide your evidence that supports the opinions that you express. So the first role here is the appellant and what the appellant might submit. Um, essentially, there's a prescribed form and checklist. Um, I, I don't really need to say much more about that. It's giving you really good guidance of what should be there. And obviously the difficulties that happen if any element of that is missed um, impacts on the procedure further down the line and causes problems for all the other participants. Um, the grounds of appeal. Uh, there's obviously a box on the form for you to fill that in. You're not bound to make your grounds of appeal fit a, a restricted text box. You, you, we fully expect that to come as a separate document uh, with an expansion of your argument as necessary. And appellants should always provide all the essential documents. And from that, I mean not just those that they're relying on to support their argument, but they must provide all the planning the planning documents, the plans, the supporting technical reports and the application forms um, that were before the planning authority. Um, that's an important part of that. Um, and to remember as you go forward that when you provide those documents, it's not an opportunity to change the proposal or to tweak it or introduce an amended um, plan because you think that will help at the appeal. Uh, we can't take a change to the proposal. We can't take a different description beyond the one that was either on the application form or one that was agreed with the planning authority. Um, and we, we can't take amendments and consider them. If you think your appeal problems could be solved by amending the proposal, then don't appeal. Um, go back to the planning authority and submit a new planning application. And find a solution uh, in, a, in, that, that, in that way. Site histories. Um, they're really, they can be really interesting, um, but they're not always relevant. So if you're going to give us the history of the site, try and focus on the parts that create some kind of context for where we are today with the appeal. And if you're going to rely on other appeal or court decisions that you feel um, reinforce a point that you want to make, make sure that you give us those documents uh, and properly reference what aspect of that document you think has a relevance to the case that we're considering. And the last thing, and it's a big plea, is uh, to all appellants out there, please try and remember to send the appeal to the planning authority at the same time. Um, or you, you, on, the, on the prescribed form, you make a declaration that you've done so, and the DPA starts from the position that we think the planning authority has the appeal at exactly the same time as we have it. And all our time periods and the engagement from that point onwards always assumes the planning authority knows all about the appeal. If that's missed, it has implications much further down the line. Generally, I have to say for the reporter, because all these delays impact on somebody's timescales and it tends to be the reporter's one at the end of the process. And now I'll turn to the planning authority's response. Again, there's a prescribed form and checklist. Same problem, if you miss a bit out, um, then uh, that has implications uh, further down the line. I also uh, want to kind of highlight the importance of the notification to third parties. 
that's a planning authority responsibility and should be done really as quickly as possible because we're expecting the third party's opportunity to comment to us to be running concurrently with the planning authority's time while they are pre presenting their information so that we get these two bits of information coming together at roughly the same time. Uh, when the planning authority provides us with representations, this is a small plea from our admin team, please provide us with the unredacted versions because we still need to see people's names and contact details because we have to engage with them through our, uh, our part of the process. And those of you who've done this often enough will be aware that once we've got large number of representations, somewhere around 50, we're going to ask you to provide a spreadsheet from your own operating software with the, the people's details, because that's going to make it much easier for us to transfer across that data into our operating software, which looks and feels quite similar to your own processes. Um, again, just as the appellant, we're expecting to provide all the relevant documents that you used and referred to in your um, uh, assessment of the application. Um, but you don't need to provide ones that are already provided by the appellant. So always have a look, see what they've given us. We, you know, if it saves time, you don't have to provide things twice. Um, but we also are looking for you to double check what the that the appellant has given us the right plans. Uh, we don't really, I know we can go and look at your online website for your case file, but we're not supposed to. We rely on the planning authority to come back and tell us that we do have the right set of drawings. So as we go forward and with the op 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 possibility that planning permission will get granted, we need to make sure that what we are going to assess is exactly the same proposal as the one that you refused or considered in your own decision. Um, don't forget um, to submit the proposed conditions. There is a requirement to do so. Um, uh, unfortunately, for those of you who know about this part process, planning authorities are very keen to add informatives. That's this little bit of advice that says, you know, um, for avoidance of doubt, this is not a building warrant or this is not listed building consent or you need permission from Scottish Water to connect to the sewer. All that useful information that, that, that the applicant might need, we can't handle through our appeal decisions, so it gets lost. So don't bother passing those on to us because we, can, we can't actually manage them through our decisions. Um, the one thing I want to say about conditions as well is please make sure you, you give a, a good bit of time to that task. Um, it, don't make it that a sort of throwaway task at the end of the process. If we do grant planning permission, those conditions or a version of them are going to come back and you'll be enforcing them and managing them. Um, so think about how you would want to manage that development in the, in the possibility that it does get planning permission. And the last point about your response is that we're really looking for EIA screening decisions, if at all possible. Uh, you may or may not be aware that the, the screening uh, regulations um, or the EIA regulations require all appeals to be screened for EIA. And so therefore we are double checking whether we've got a Schedule 2 discretionary project, whether it's breaching thresholds or impacts. And um, if you've already done that screening, that saves us a lot of trouble. If you don't know what your planning authority's screening arrangements are at the registration stage of the application, find out. Um, if you think your planning authority doesn't have a process for screening at registration, then I would so, uh, certainly commend you to put one in place. Um, it, there is a genuine risk that appeal could, uh, an applicant could go all the way to the appeal and discover that they have an EIA development and the whole thing is put on hold until that's resolved. Um, uh, for those of you, and I know you're out there somewhere that have worked with me in local authority, you'll know that was one of my uh, I was quite evangelical about EI screening and it hasn't changed. You'll be glad to know six years away. I'm still um, battering that drum. Right. <clears throat> so I'm looking at elements of good practice for planning authorities here. This is a little bit from my own background in local authorities, but also how, how I see it as a reporter. Um, you rely all the time on uh, report of handling. Uh, that when the mandatory task came in uh, 15, 20 years ago, um, that's now something that we would expect you to come forward. I know everybody's time pressured. I would expect uh, if you are managing your time, put that little bit of effort into reports of handling that are dealing with refusals so that those are the ones that are best set up, ready to, to act as the bare bones of an appeal submission. Remember section 25, uh, and the dominance of the development plan in your decision making. 
Um, quite often that gets a little bit lost uh, in submissions. And if I'm going to say anything uh, about development plans, I really need to touch on NPF 4 today. Uh, over the last year, we've seen the role of that document obviously come on stream and, to have, and it has quite a, a different role from Scottish planning policy. Um, I would certainly commend you to make sure your staff are aware of the differences and that they are comfortable with understanding the dominant role of NPF 4 as the most up-to-date uh, planning policy document. Um, you, I think you'll have seen at the start of 2023, um, we were spending a lot of time chasing new submissions to try and get the planning authority's views on NPF 4 uh, because we really needed to take it, to take it into account. Um, my other advice to you, having tried to use the online uh, form as a planning officer coming back in, is actually get all your working documents ready, get your appeal statement ready, what you want to see, get your documents ready, your digital documents, get your document list ready. Get that done first and so that when you come back to use the online form, everything's ready and then you can work through that online form much quicker than getting halfway through and discovering you'll need to go and create digital versions of 10 documents and, and you haven't got them ready. Um, the other thing I'd like to highlight to you is this issue of how you might present the planning authority response. Um, you may be aware if, when you're if you're following the appeals that come in, reporters are often allocated a group of appeals for one authority area. And we're aware of quite often of a lack of consistency in approach um, within that authority and also between authorities. And I can see a real benefit for those authorities who have put in place some kind of working process, some kind of template based submission that makes sure your case officers are, are presenting the, your council's position in as, as professional a manner as possible. Um, I've seen things from um, simple emails to well constructed annotated reports um, with uh, paragraph numbers and everything in between. And I was thinking of the of the uh, the similarity perhaps with your own report of handling process. You, you, you couldn't imagine presenting to your planning committee with 10 different uh, reports of handling templates. And it's a bit like that coming to the to the uh, uh, appeal process. Have a think about how you want your your process to look when it goes out into that uh, uh, forum. I also uh, think having a good internal appeal process is really helpful for, for training purposes when you've got inexperienced staff that's never been a set, uh, never dealt with an appeal before. It's good for obviously for consistency um, and it's good for remote working. Uh, I know most planning authorities will have at least some of their staff working from home uh, after COVID and having these sort of documents in place because you're no longer sitting working directly with uh, team members is really beneficial. And that as an extension of that, I'd also like to kind of um, ask you to have a think about how what, how your authority is going to deal with decisions that are contrary to recommendation, how you're going to fit that into your own established procedures, and also with deemed refusals. Um, think about whether or not you need to create streamlined processes to get uh, authority for case officers to defend that appeal and to create a, a working uh, um, set of reasons so that, that the, their work can be more focused uh, rather than to leave it open-ended. I think there's benefits in doing that. Um, I'm now moving on to uh, the role of third parties. Um, there's uh, they, That covers uh, uh, mostly the, the people who have made representations through the planning application process, but also include um, the consultees that have been engaged in the process. Uh, first thing to remember is your original letter is made available to us from the planning authority. You don't need to have to send it again. It means we've got to read it twice to work out if it's different. So everything, anything that can save time is, is, is welcome. Um, it is important to try and submit within the time period because at the end of the uh, period for representations, we start another bit of process with the appellant. So knowing that we've got everything in in time is important. And also remember that that engaging with the DPA is it's not a complaint process. It's not an opportunity to come and tell us and expect us to adjudicate on how the council handled the case or how the appellant or the applicant conducted themselves through the planning applic application process. We still really want to focus on what you think about the planning merits of the proposal. 
Uh, if you've made representations, you might also be asked to opt in to further process, and Sinead's probably going to pick that up in one of her parts of her presentation. Um, and uh, once we have the information from the uh, council and from the representations, the appellant has the right of response. You, there is some accusation sometimes that this might seem unfair, but if you, if I take you back to my very first slide and say that the appeal is um, triggered by the appellant's desire to have their decision re-examined, and therefore the procedures have always been set up to allow the appellant the final right of response to any comments that are made. But also, I want to kind of tell appellants or appellants agents out there, try to focus on any new matters that have been raised through that process. Don't use the, the response as a, as a means to repeat your case. Again, any duplication just uh, takes up time and effort on, on everybody's part. Uh, again, if you introduce new documents or issues uh, to try and counter a, a matter that's been raised, uh, be aware that that in itself might trigger further process and or uh, start another consultation process as a result of that. So be cautious with introducing new things. Uh, again, Sinead might come on to that in her um, part of the presentation. Uh, and also, if you're the appellant, try and remember to comment on the conditions or any uh, heads of terms for a planning obligation. It's useful to know if any of the things presented by the council are going to give you significant concern. Um, but I'm just going to touch very briefly on claims for expenses. You might be aware that there is an opportunity to claim for expenses through an appeal process. Um, that's set out primarily within Circular 6 of 1990. It's never been updated. Um, the important thing to remember about it is that the claim can be made up to the end of exchanges through the process. It's not about conduct during just about conduct through the planning application process. So your conduct in the appeal, whether you're the appellant or the council, can have an impact on, on uh, that potential for a claim for expenses. Um, the key test is unreasonable behaviour, and I, I'm not going to go into it in detail because the circular is, is really good for that. It gives you lots of examples of what might be unreasonable behaviour. But unreasonable behaviour must lead to unnecessary expense. The two things go hand in hand. Uh, it's not just about being aggrieved by the decision. It has to be a bit more than that before you would be ex successful in a claim for expenses. And I'm going to come back to this issue of evidence and documents. Um, first and foremost, I'm going to um, plead to you the importance of having a good document list with numbers. Uh, it makes it much easier to manage when we, we set up our own digital file here in DPA. It's much easier to reference a document through uh, further process or in the decision itself. And it's easier for us to know that we've got everything and that we've properly read it and made sure we've covered everything. Digital documents are great. That's fine. Uh, we are encouraging that. We work in a digital world. On the whole, PDF type documents, fixed documents are fine. Um, a wee plea from reporters who are doing uh, complicated cases such as wind farms where we might have to create a set of working conditions at the end. Sometimes the proposed conditions would be beneficial in Word um, because that allows us to manage the text much easier should we have to insert them into our final decision. And also with uh, evidence and documents, don't overwhelm the reporter with things that aren't actually relevant. If you're going to give us significant documents, you know, large uh, uh, policy documents, but you re you know only one small chapter of that is relevant, please help us out by saying I'm referring to this document, but it's actually chapter two that's relevant. That helps us prioritise how we're going to spend time looking at that document and working out how it should be applied in the context of this decision. And the last question I have, which is something that you may or may not know about, is one of the questions perhaps Trevor's going to ask, is about the DPA online document library. And that was something that we created uh, over the last couple of years initially to help uh, create a suite of documents that could be easily retrieved uh, when dealing with the energy consents parts of the process. And then we realised it was equally beneficial for planning authorities or any appellant dealing with planning authority documents. And what we have is, uh, and I'm going to show you the next slide, each, I don't, it doesn't come out very clearly, but basically each local authority has an element of the, of the library where you can go and find simple things like the development plan, um, statutory uh, planning guidance and other technical reports. These are documents the councils have given to us. They're not ones we've chosen. 
um, they're all indexed and each of them have a hyperlink. And that means when you're doing your list of documents, you don't have to go and create a new digital document every time you're doing this. What you can do is create your document list, identify the document you're referring to and insert the hyperlink to that version of the document in our library. The reason why we would like you to do that is that we manage that library and there's a certain security and continuity with that version of the document. If you give us hyperlinks to other documents in, held in other directories out there in the internet, big, big bad world wide web, uh, they might change between the point where you decided they were relevant and the point where I read them. We can't ensure their continuity. And that's why we don't accept hyperlinks to other, other websites. Um, I, I highly commend the library. It could save you so much time. Uh, all you need to do is learn how to insert a hyperlink. And I have to say, I can do it. And if I can do it, then anybody can. Um, and I suppose in summing up for a Passover to Sinead is basically just to say, if you take nothing away from my bit of the presentation, it's about proportionate and relevant evidence um, and well-structured evidence. Uh, that makes a huge difference to us. And that's uh, what I would really love to see in every appeal that I pick up. So I'll hand over to Sinead now. I'll just get rid of my Thank PowerPoint. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sinead Lynch and I'm also a reporter at DPA and have been in both as a self-employed reporter and employed reporter for um, 10 years. My background is in planning consultancy and I have worked um, across the UK and also in Australia. My part of this presentation is looking at the procedures we employ to determine appeals, um, what's available to us and basically why we use them. Um, today's session is a high level overview. Um, so depending on what people are seeking in terms of further training, which Trevor's question will explore later in the session, um, we potentially will be able to go into greater depth at another point in the future. So today's really is a skim across how and why. Um, the very initial thing we look at as do we have enough information to determine the appeal in front of us? And how we do that is, as Elspeth mentioned earlier, we work entirely in a regulatory framework. We look, first of all, at the 2013 regulations, but we also look at development management regs, permitted development, use classes, et cetera, et cetera. And then the regulations and legislation that apply to specific categories of development, such as listed buildings, Section 36 cases, environmental appeals, and all the rest. Um, the preliminary things we look at are, has the appeal been supported with all the relevant documentation? So have I got a copy of the development plan? Do I know what the relevant policies are? Have I got the correct plans? Elspeth alluded to this earlier, but it is surprising how often we get the wrong version of plans or we find the reasons for refusal, which have prompted the appeal, have been addressed by a complete new set of plans, and those are then submitted with the appeal. We would obviously discourage that approach, but quite often the appeal can be with us before we note that those plans are incorrect. Um, have the reasons for refusal been addressed in the statement? Have all the consultation responses, which have been provided to the planning authority, actually been forwarded to us? Have all the representations been provided? If case law is referred to by the appellant or the planning authority, do we have either the cases or the hyperlinks to the cases? All of these things are the very first preliminary things we look at. In looking at fairness and natural justice, we have to balance that against the efficiency of the planning appeal system. Um, has everybody actually seen everything they should see? Has everything been copied to all the relevant parties? Is it all on the web page, other than that which needs to be redacted? And is it accessible to all? Has there been an opportunity for everybody to comment on the parts of the appeal that they're entitled to comment on? All of these things reporters keep tabs on. It's not just the case officer, although their input is invaluable in managing that process. The reporter is ultimately the person who needs to be comfortable that fairness and natural justice have been expressed. Site visits. 
although they're not always necessary, they are almost always required. In practice, it's exceptional to not go on a site visit, be it accompanied or unaccompanied. Some examples of an exception might be amenity notices, some certificates of lawful use and development, in limited circumstances enforcement notice, some section 242 applications, and often planning obligation appeals don't necessitate a site visit because the matters raised are not physical aspects of the site. But Having carried out the site visit, the next part we might look at is further written submissions to obtain the information that we've noted is missing. It might not actually deliver the required response that we require, and therefore another procedure might be required. That may be a hearing, and exceptionally, that might be a public inquiry. It may be obvious from the outset that a hearing will be required to resolve matters which are apparent when the appeal is submitted and in that case the reporter and the case officer will set the hearing process in motion and I will discuss that a little later um, in another slide. As we mentioned an inquiry is the exception not the expectation. The procedure is used to discuss complex and technical areas and where there are conflicts in professional opinions and where there is a dispute about essential facts relating to the case. What I will do now is run through each of those potential procedures that are available to us in a little bit more detail. So site inspections. We do actually have a question which the panel are going to address later at the end of the whole session, which looks at site visits. So that will cover some of the issues you have raised. Um, Accompanied or unaccompanied site visits, how do we decide? It's actually very site specific and very case specific. Quite often there may be access from a public area and we don't need access to the site or a building or an area. So in that case, an unaccompanied site visit can take place. The reporter can be content that they've seen everything that they need to see and that the matters raised in the appeal have been addressed by an unaccompanied site visit because you have clear and unfettered access to everything. In other cases, um, it's not possible to access a site without gaining entrance to a building or a gated area, or it might be slightly unsafe and you need people with you. Also, walking a site with the parties and looking at the physical aspects of the site is a very useful exercise and it can quite often assist in understanding the relative positions of parties. We always wait for the full exchange of written submissions associated with an appeal before we go on site, as that means we can be reasonably sure that we know what we're looking at and we know the pertinent things to look at. If it's accompanied, all parties to the appeal are invited. If the Appellant or the planning authority doesn't show up to an accompanied site visit, it makes life quite difficult for us as reporters, as we then can't take the other parties who are there with us on site. And the actual benefit to us of an accompanied site visit is lost. Um, what I would say to all parties is come prepared. We like to see all aspects of the site and sometimes the surrounding area. So it's always useful if the parties are more familiar with it than we are because quite often it will be our first time physically seeing the site in real life. Try not to engage with the parties you disagree with on site. It's never comfortable to be in the middle of warring factors and ultimately it means our focus is moved away from the matter in hand when we have to try and mediate between parties on site. Make sure there is safe access to the site and within the site. Ideally, no livestock, um, raging torrents, high walls, and I do speak from experience. Try to accommodate all parties. You might not wish to give access to all parties, but it does help the reporter to be able to ask all the parties questions regarding the site when we are actually on the site. No. Sorry, no discussion of merit. We do appreciate how difficult it actually is to avoid giving evidence at a site inspection, and we do try and help parties to avoid it wherever possible. 
Sending a representative can help rather than an entire committee or interest group. But I would emphasize it's never an opportunity to restate your case or to give fresh evidence. We have in the past reminded people that the written process is their opportunity to make their case. But if there is something that they have missed or the site visit has prompted a thought, um, they need to contact the case officer and submit that item as soon as possible. It should be borne in mind that that may result in a procedure notice and it will inevitably affect your target date. But it does come back to what Elspeth said earlier in that front loading your submission as much as possible will, will result in a faster decision as we simply won't have to carry out all the additional procedures. Moving on to further written submissions, I would um, suggest that you all, if you can access the Scottish Government webpage, look at the Planning and Environmental Appeals Guidance, which is note eight, and it's Planning and Environmental Appeals Guidance for Reporters. There's 26 guidance notes and they're all available in PDF um, format. Very useful information contained in there if you haven't yet seen it. The general reasons we seek further written submissions are actually many and varied. And sometimes it's the submissions themselves from any party which might lack the required information. If it's a missing document, we very often will ask informally for it. But if other parties haven't seen that document, then they should be offered the opportunity to comment. Quite often, additional submissions are made during the appeal process, which then necessitates asking other parties' views on those documents. Fair and proportionate and part of natural justice, but it does add time to our decision making process. We give people 14 days to provide the information we ask for, and then generally other parties are given 14 days to respond or comment should they so wish. What I would say is that it's critical to provide the actual information we are looking for, not what we think we might be looking for or what you might like us to hear. And concise answers are always preferred. It's very easy to stray into your full case when we're asking a very specific question. Um, if you need to, in further written submission um, responses, do attach new documents that you refer to in your answer, but you do need to be wary of straying into new matters or issues which are not already before the reporter and not part of the further written submission request. Moving on to hearings, um, we work to the hearing inquiry session rules and they're set out in the 2013 appeal regulations and they're set under regulation 26. All of the hearing session rules are set out in schedule one and circular six um, 2009 remains the minister's um, policy expression on hearings. Um, when is it a hearing and not an inquiry? It's when reporters need to enhance their understanding through an explanation of evidence and opinions, and that's where it's a matter of a difference in opinion and generally not facts or settled matters. A hearing can often be a more efficient and effective procedure to enable a reporter's understanding of the matters before him or her. They can be standalone procedures or can often be part of a combination of all or any further procedures available to us. It starts with an opt-in notice, which the case officer will send to all interested parties to the appeal, asking if they wish them to be involved and advising them that there is a 14-day period in which to tell us if you do want to participate. If you don't wish to participate, and I really would stress this, your original representation will still be taken into account. Appearing at an oral process does not make your representation more or less valid. We give equal weight to all the representations put in front of us. Um, only those who've actually opted in to the hearing process will be notified of the procedures and arrangements moving forward but everybody will remain to be notified of the outcome of the appeal. If it's a relatively straightforward matter to be heard with limited parties, then no, generally no pre-examination 
um, meeting will be required. Regulation 10 sets out that um, oral, proceeding, oral proceedings should assist in the efficient delivery of decisions. And what we don't want to do is to add further complicated procedures when they're simply not required. Where um, a pre-examination meeting does take place, at that meeting we would seek to resolve pretty much all procedural matters, such as the evidence required, the timetable for that, who will deliver that evidence, the dates on which the hearings will take place, the time, the venue, and all those matters. We try wherever possible and wherever practical to encourage parties to join forces, simply because that benefits all of us in terms of conciseness and efficiency. We will circulate an agenda for the hearing a minimum 14 days beforehand, so everybody can see what questions the reporter has. Um, those who've opted in will be invited and following that um, pre-examination meeting, a note will be circulated to all parties. Even if you haven't opted in, that note will be available on our website for everybody to see. Um, a procedure notice is the next step telling you where, when and how the hearing will take place. We will also in that note set out if hearing statements are required and who should submit them and by when. Um, not everybody needs to submit a hearing statement. Um, they do need to be sufficiently detailed so that we can understand what evidence and what documents you're going to rely on at the hearing itself. Um, the day of the hearing, um, the report will be begin by explaining to all the parties how it's going to be conducted, the running order and the timings. A hearing, although informal, it is chaired by the reporter and all questions go through the reporter and the reporter will direct how evidence is heard. Um, we direct who answers which questions and in what order. And we may invite certain parties to respond to particular questions and we may prompt your participation if you are there. Um, a hearing may prompt an accompanied site inspection following it, but not always. Um, it's an informal discussion, but we appreciate it can often not really feel like that, particularly if you're not accustomed to taking part in such events. But it is intended to help us tease out the reasons behind the difference in opinion that we see in the written submissions. And it is ultimately to enhance our understanding of the evidence and the submissions in order that we can make a good decision. Um, recently, and um, prompted by the pandemic, um, the question has arisen of whether it should be a virtual or an in-person oral process. Obviously not something that we have had to deal with in the past, but now it's reality as evidenced by today for all of us. Quite often, a virtual process can be the most efficient and effective. We do understand that for many people, in-person is preferable and sometimes easier. We do try and webcast everything, but there are limitations to our capacity to do that. And sometimes IT capacity at venues can be a limiting factor. However, when something is webcast, we seek your permission for you to uh, participate. Um, but by participating, your um, permission is implicit. We keep all our webcast sessions on our webcast library and um, it's not quite Netflix, but we do try. Um, moving to public inquiries. Again, as I said before, a public inquiry can be a standalone process or it can simply be part of a number of further procedures that we employ to reach a decision. Um, there is a panel question about when is it an inquiry or when is it a hearing? So I'm only going to briefly address it here and I have mentioned it previously, but in essence, it's when complicated and technical evidence needs to be tested by cross-examination. And it's really when there are two diamet diametrically opposed opinions and quite often experts and when facts are in actual dispute. We follow the inquiry session rules and expect everybody else to do so. Those are set out in the 2013 appeal regulations at Schedule 2. You will also find on the Scottish webpage a guidance note on inquiries. 
Again, we start with a procedure notice, um, parties opt in, and then there will be a pre-examination with the process pretty much as set out for hearings. We do advertise the sessions for inquiries in formal newspaper adverts. And in almost all cases, and I really can't think of any case where they wouldn't, the appellant and the planning authority will provide inquiry statements. Other parties' appeal representations may be sufficient, but you can be asked by us to provide a statement if we feel we need it. Unique to the inquiry process are precognitions, which set out the case and all the documents to be relied on during the inquiry. All submissions by all parties much, must be exchanged with each other, and we have set time periods within which that exchange takes place. Everything produced for a public inquiry subject to redaction and um, any commercial confidentiality is placed on our web page and is accessible to everybody, not just those who opted in. Sometimes we will accept rebuttal recognitions as they can be helpful, they can reduce technical differences and they can minimise cross-examination during the inquiry itself. Um, a huge help to case officers and reporters are clearly and logically ordered document lists, which are then ideally updated in a timely fashion throughout the inquiry process. That doesn't always happen for many reasons, but it is very useful. At the inquiry itself, we will explain the procedure and how the sessions will be conducted and what your respected, your respective expected role in the proceedings will be. Um, we appreciate that for some it's a daily routine and for others it might be the only part they take part in such a process. It can be intimidating and we don't underestimate how difficult it can be for um, all those taking part. We do strive to be accommodating, but within the confines of the regulations. Sometimes we, we find um, it's best to try and prepare by anticipating what the other parties will ask you. It can often feel as if you're being interrogated, which in essence you are. The process can be difficult and stressful, but answering the questions asked makes the process easier. Conceding points may feel counterintuitive, but it doesn't diminish the rest of your case when we make our assessment at the end of the day. Should it be virtual or in person? And the answer to that is whichever we think is most efficient for our purposes. All will be webcast subject to, most avail subject to availability of our IT systems, but most will be recorded and in the webcast library to access at later points. At inquiries, generally, we invite parties to make closing submissions, generally in writing, um, really for efficiency re reasons. And the appellant has the very last word in that exchange of documents. Short and to the point is our preference for closing submissions. Um, reporters need to be prepared for the unexpected when it comes to holding inquiry sessions and uh, things that affect or are unexpected, probably not now, are snow, road closures, dogs, people falling asleep, people joining the wrong meetings, Zumba classes in the adjoining hall, um, no Wi-Fi and being locked out of the hall you actually booked. We have managed to cope with all of the above and generally will. Um, my last slide looks at the reporter's assessment. And it's difficult in one slide to explain our assessment process, so it, it really is a canter through this, but we really do look at cases de novo. It may feel as if we're repeating the process, but that's not actually the case. We approach every appeal on its merits and we're in no way bound by the conclusions reached by other decision makers. Um, as mentioned before, we start from the legislative and regulatory context, and then we look to move at material considerations. We often hear parties questioning how material is a material consideration, and, and our answer to that would be, it depends. The weight we give to factors varies, and that's how we approach our cases. Um, it, it really does depend on each individual case, and that's how it is approached by us as reporters. Um, we very often have non-material matters raised in submissions, and we often have to mention in decision notice 
that while these matters have been raised, they haven't actually been material to the decision arrived at. Um, quite often we find, and Elspeth has alluded to this earlier, parties express their dissatisfaction with each other. We may or may not have sympathy with you, but it is not a material consideration. Um, we also quite often get factors related to uh, views, the cost of your house, the cost of the development being built and the house that was allowed up the road and so on and so forth. None of these matters are material to our decisions. And very briefly on conditions and obligations, we always, always like and need to have proposed conditions from minimum the planning authority and in more complex cases an agreed set of conditions is ideal. We also would like a clear and evidenced pathway to obligations and an understanding from the parties about the implications of any obligation. That's all from Elspeth and I for now. We will be answering some of your questions in the panel session later on this afternoon. Thank you. Well, I'm conscious, I'm conscious of this day of time, so I am going to be quite short. Um, I'm Elaine Ferguson Black. I'm a, a partner and co head of planning in the Brodies team. And so I've been asked to kind of speak briefly about the appellant's perspective. Um, and I've divided it up into kind of, you see, there's kind of seven brief slides, because I'm very conscious that Elspeth and Sinead have done fabulous, you know, kind of presentations and given you most of the detail. So this is probably just a little bit of colour. So if you want to pop on my first slide then, um, Trevor, or can I can I do that myself? Uh, you should have yeah, access I should to that. Yeah. That's it. So just a couple of pre-appeal points um, just um, to make it clear, obviously, it is only the applicant that can appeal. So it's always, um, at, particularly if you're involved in, you know, your, uh, a deal between, um, you know, a housing developer, say, and the landowner or whatever, in what name was the application put in? Do you have rights of appeal if the... Um, the deal falls through because you might have to then have stepping rights and you might have to run it in somebody else's uh, name. Um, so as they make it sure that um, you've got one eye on appeal, I always think it's terrible to have one eye on um, everything going wrong, but that's what lawyers do. We're always looking ahead just in case. So only that we can appeal. And then the, the, the normal one, and make sure that you've submitted everything to the planning authority um, as part of the application if you're what you're going to have to go and rely on appeal. And that's because nowadays we are limited in terms of what you can submit. And um, I think this is quite a challenging one, uh, particularly when you've got applications that are dealt with under delegated powers and you don't quite know when that decision is going to happen. Um, and there may be a document that I had wanted to go in, but I then, you know, I'm, I'm unable to do it because the delegated uh, decision has been issued. And, um, you know, I've got one at the moment where um, we've just had a very late uh, consultation response and the indication is that it's going to be refused on the back of it without us having a right of response um, to it. Now that would be one if we do go to appeal that I would certainly be indicating um, that I need to be able to respond to that. Um, and it wasn't, wouldn't have been a document that was before the, app, uh, before the planning authority, but there is uh, a requirement for me to address it. Um, but making sure that you've got as much as possible all your um, information in as part of the application. And then just that point there that, you know, you don't have to notify the owners of your appeal, but if it's a listed building consent appeal and the applicant is not the owner of the building, then the applicant must notify the owners, the other owners, 21 days before you submit the appeal. So that's the one in terms of regulation, regulation 18, you actually have to do the notification before submitting the appeal, normally with planning applications. Um, and planning appeals, as we, we heard there, notifying the planning authority, you do it at the same time. But for the listed buildings, you have to do it, um, you do it in advance. So those are just kind of some pre-appeal um, points to bear in mind. Statement um, of appeal, uh, um, in terms of it being um, concise, <laughs> and I know that the reporters want con a concise case, I have never uh, managed to just fill that box. So in fact, I don't even try to just fill that box. I say see separate statement of appeal. Um, and I'm always impressed that reporters can get all their evidence and all the, the submissions that they made from all sides down into a few pages in their decision letter. I go, oh my goodness, you know, that's um, that's very impressive. And I do know for the applicants, it can be very hard to get that get everything into um, a short, brief appeal statement, particularly if the application has been running for months or, or years. 
and there is a lot of angst um, between parties. And we've heard, you know, the reporters aren't really interested in that. Uh, but sometimes the applicant just needs to get that out offload to me, and then I will refine it and, and pull it down, and so that um, try and focus on the things that um, are relevant in terms of the um, the planning issues. There's no um, required form. But um, as Elspeth mentioned, you know, recommending that the planning authority um, maybe have templates. I have a template. We have a, a template that we use, uh, and I tend to, you know, go on the basis of executive summary at the start in case you do, in case the reporters don't need anything but the beginning. Um, so executive summary, you know, at the start, then set out the details of the appellant, set out the details of the site and its surroundings, set out what the proposed development is, any relevant. And the planning history, as Elspeth said, um, the planning policies, um, the material considerations, and then I tend to have the grounds of appeal. And um, I try to avoid discussing the application in the development plan section, or else you end up doing it twice. So I tend to just do the policies, and then I have a discussion section, and then I have um, my conditions and planning obligations comment before the conclusion. So I try to do it um, a bit like a committee report, I suppose, or a report of handling or um, a reporter's decision letter. I will highlight the key issues, what I think are the key issues, because when I look at reporter's decision letters, that's what they do. So uh, try to be helpful and say these are what I think the, the, they are. Um, in insert, I, I would say keep tying it back to the policy. So in the conclusions, I would always take them back to section 25, as Sinead said, in terms of that's the, the, the starting uh, framework and the legislative framework, I would go back to that. Um, and again, picking up the point that Elson made, insert your document numbers and your page numbers when you are referencing um, a document within the appeal statement or recognition, you know, as you go further on, because you want the reporter to go to that particular uh, part of the um, of the, the document. And I did laugh when there's a suggestion of, you know, keep your documents out, often have lots and lots of documents. Um, but I do try to indicate it's this piece, this piece and I will... Um, sometimes cut and paste the paragraph into the appeal statement so that you know that's actually the bit that I'm, I'm wanting you to refer to. Um, and the bottom one, check, check typos, numbering, formatting. I can remember um, a reporter fairly early on in my career um, indicating that you know he kind of almost marked my closing submissions depending on whether there were if there were typos and you know errors in it. So always double check it. A bit like an essay, you're submitting it's an essay. If you haven't, if you've got errors in it, particularly in the fir first page, what does that do to the rest of it? With the credibility, how do you look at it? So they say just in terms of um, checking it and making sure that it um, it all ties together. If you're anything like me, you move paragraphs around, and if you've got document numbers and you change your document number list, make sure that you've cross-referred that. I would always get another pair of eyes uh, to do that. So I'll do the appeal statement and then somebody else in the team will read it um, as well to make sure it hangs together. And then um, in the documents itself, as, as we heard as Elspeth said, the, the regulations specify what needs to be included um, in the appeal. And it's not specified in the regs, but it is on the um, the appeal form that the first one I put there when listing plans and drawings, please quote the reference the planning authority gave them. That caught me out. Um, I've had to renumber an entire list of documents that I submitted to a planning appeal because I hadn't realised that the planning authority had actually given them numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. And I, I normally, or I used to, start my document list with the application and the application drawings. Then the decision notice, you know, as I was narrating, I suppose, the, the history. But in fact, now you start with whatever it is, document one, a plan um, that the planning authority um, has said. So my plea to planning authorities would make it clear that there are numbered drawings on the on the decision notice. Don't just put the, the number of the drawing, but if it's document, if it's plan one, you know, and it's site plan, plan two, location plan or whatever. And then we would start the documents list for the appellant with those numbers and then start adding on and at the bottom of it. And then linked to that is um, making sure that the title of the plan matches what it says on the plan. Because, again, I've been asked by DP previously, say, well, but you've called it this on the document list, but the plan number, you know, in the box on the um, on the plan is something else. So make sure that the list and the, um, the what it says on the plan itself um, matches. Um, as Elspeth said, um, the appellants don't need to send a set of documents to the council, just the list. 
and, and copies of anything which the authority doesn't um, already have. So again, that can save you because there could be quite a number of documents, but the planning authority has already got them. And then the planning authority needs to lodge anything which wasn't on the appellants list, um, which they took into account in determining the application. So that is a way of picking up anything um, that might have fallen through the gaps. I have had um, third parties indicate that there was something that we didn't lodge, but then the planning authority um, lodged it. Um, I'm reliably informed by my EA that uploading documents to the portal is really time consuming. Um, and that there are a limit on the size of the documents, but you can do it in advance, so you can upload it in stages. Um, and also, um, some characters that aren't accepted, such as the colon dash. I like using colon dashes, um, and um, apparently they don't work. So don't use them in document titles. Um, so just kind of small things like that. Uh, paginate, uh, paginate your reports and your documents. That's particularly uh, important if you're going to go to hearings or inquiries and you want to draw somebody to um, a particular part, you know, go to page such and such um, and so that you can focus on it or else if you've got a document that's got no pagination on it, it's a nightmare to try to find everybody on the same, you know, on the same page. I would also, if you're in that one, be saying make sure everything, if it's double sided, they're all copied double sided, they're all copied colour and all of those things. Um, and then Plans need to be provided at the scale that's on the drawing. And um, my understanding is that DPA can only print off at A3, so that if you need anything that's uh, at a different scale, it's A0, it's A1, it's A2, you need to provide hard copies to DPA as well. Um, so not just the electronic versions, but you need to provide hard copies, which can be then passed on to, um, to the reporter. And then in terms of Further process, of, as we've heard, when you use the appellant, submit your planning um, appeal, you need to indicate your method of determination, although it's ultimately the reporter's uh, decision. Um, I have asked recently for a hearing. I don't tend to now. Uh, the good old days had inquiries all the time um, and then hearings and now they're all written submissions. But I, di I did seek a hearing recently when I felt that we'd been unable during the application process to engage on a transport issue. and. Um, Effectively, it was going to be the opportunity to try to get more information and have the discussion um, with, the, with the council. In fact, if we were being looking for a access to a transport model, the reporter then asked for access to the model, uh, which is what I was hoping they would do. And, and we got it and we did. And then we didn't need the hearing. So but I, I kind of, I suppose, almost used that as a, as a kind of um, tool to be able to make sure the reporter needs all the information, just as Elspeth said, it's all evidence based, needs all the information up front. Um, and we were we were keen to juice it as well. Um, in terms of why might hearing or inquiry be needed, and I know we're going to talk about further information requests in the um the discussion at the end. I do think sometimes it would be easier to have a hearing than to have the further information requests. I know that you know Sinead commented that um if you don't get the answer, you issue another one. Sometimes I think we might get there quicker if we were all either in a virtual room or a real room having that discussion um, rather than the 14 days here and the 14 days back. And that leads me to my keep on top of time limits. Um, 14 days is not very long, particularly if you get um, something you know, at five o'clock on a Friday and then you don't get it out to the clients over the weekend and then it starts and then you've got to draft it and then you've got to get it you know, approved and then back. You'll find that your 14 days um, goes quite quickly. Um, Elspeth mentioned that ideally at the appeal, you know, when the, the planning authority is notifying the uh, third parties, they do it at the, the same time. Um, so that the period for the planning authority responding and third parties responding is the same. I would agree with that because there's nothing worse from the appellant's point of view of getting, um, I suppose, the third party responses in kind of drip fed. Um, I would often say um, and, and ask, could I just respond to them all at the same time? Um, and generally, could I respond to them all when I respond to the planning authority? Because often there'll be the points that will be covered anyway so that it's quicker um, and cheaper. And I would have thought less paperwork for everybody to have to deal with if we can just kind of um, take them all together. Um, also on the kind of responding to the, the council or further information requests, um, I know Elspeth you know, said, try not to rehearse what you've said before. I would normally say, I do not intend to rehearse the statements that I've made, in, but I will rely on anything that was already in the previous appeal statement. 
part of that's in case I forget something. Um, so it's always a kind of, I've, re I've already said it, I've relied on it, and I'm trying to just focus on um, these particular points. Um, and in addition to time limits, it's being aware of your team's diaries. As Sinead said, you go to a pre-examination meeting and you want to have everything um, agreed. So be aware of your team's diaries. You know, will they be able to meet the deadlines for submitting their statements, submitting the documents, the precognitions? Do you need to ask for longer time? Because um, get that in, in up front and say, well, you know, for whatever reason, we're not going to meet that deadline. And then, the, you know, both parties can agree or uh, that it's, a, it's it's kind of slightly a different date. Um, also to try to keep on top of things if there are further information requests um, and new documents as there was reference, I, I issue an updated document list so that there's always an updated document list and I run them, I continue to run them consecutively. So if it was up to 20 documents in the appeal and we have another one, I'll add on and that's then becomes 21, 22, 23 and just keep updating the kind of master um, document list. Um, and then expenses, again, Elspeth touched on um, <laughs> expenses. And unlike courts, expenses don't follow su uh, the success, as Elspeth said, um, that's the basis is set out in the circular um, and you must apply for it at the appropriate time in proceedings. And um, in the case of a public local inquiry, that's before the inquiry is concluded. And in the case of written submissions procedure, it should normally accompany the last um, submission. That gets difficult nowadays, I find, with further information requests, because I don't know whether they have got to the end. You know, it's, it's not as simple as appellant planning authority appellant nowadays. So I write to DPA and ask, <laughs> is that now that it concluded if I'm going to be putting in an expenses claim? Um, because, I, again, as Elspeth said, it might be unreasonable conduct during the appeal itself. So I don't put them in up front. I might hint sometimes that I, I think I'm going to be doing one. Um, but I will do it and I'll seek confirmation of whether this is the appropriate time. And so it's got to be unreasonable conduct and unnecessary expense. And, and again, as Elspeth said, the examples are set out in the circular for planning authorities, appellants and third parties. The one thing I would flag up to appellants, you know, is that a, a planning authority that not following the recommendation of the planning officer is not unreasonable conduct. They are entitled uh, to do that, and um, that doesn't justify a claim for expenses because that's the most common one that I get asked. Um, but it does need to be unreasonable conduct, and generally for us, it would be um, not defending the reasons for refusal, you know, not having a basis for it, and uh, or not putting or putting forward, um, not defending a particular reason for refusal, and that has caused the appeal to be necessary. So that's generally the unnecessary e expense. Um, and then even if you do get your expenses, you don't necessarily get them all uh, back. I would uh, try to agree the expenses with the planning authority. I've just done one just now um, with, the, with the planning authority, which is great. Gave them the entries they've been agreed, because if not, you end up going to taxation. You end up having to get a law accountant to prepare you know, an account of expenses. That's additional expense that gets added. You then need to have a taxation diet and, and all of that just keeps mounting up. So I would um, encourage both the appellant and the local and the local authority, the planning authority to uh, talk in terms of the expenses. And then my final slide uh, is just the two most important people in the um, appeal process, the reporter, because they're going to be making um, the decision. Um, so all the things that you've heard from Sinead and Elspeth that you want to help to make their life easier, do that um, and it'll be smoother. And then the case officer, because the case officer is the person that you will be dealing with all the time um, and they're so helpful um, in terms of asking, you know, what, what should you be doing? You know, trying to sort things out. Um, they're they're very, very good. I um, So keep on top of them, be nice to them as well uh, because they're very important. So that's me as a real whistle stop for the appellants. And uh, thank you to Elaine for stepping in to go um, before me. Um, it does mean, though, that I get to have the last say, which hardly ever happens in an appeal. Um, so that's <laughs> interesting. Um, I'm going to cover the um, very similar things. Ironically, we're saying don't repeat things, um, but there are going to be things that are repetition in relation to what Elspeth and Elaine have said. It's from a local authority perspective, um, but it is, it's probably from a not the appellant perspective. So some of it will be, I know there's a lot of community councils and third parties um, on the training as well. So some of it will be will be more relevant to you perhaps. Um, so yeah, that's me. I am, I'm at West Lothian Council. I've been here for 23 years working in development management. 
Um, in that time, I have dealt with a range of planning applications and appeals, um, mostly written submissions, which is what I'm going to focus on today. Um, I, was, I have assisted on an inquiry, although it was quite some time ago, and I've done a couple of hearings. Um, and helped my team through a couple of hearings recently. Um, my first appeal was actually for um, an advertisement consent. It was for a signboard um, outside a bookmakers in a small village on the edge of Livingston. It was done by written submissions um, over 20 years ago and an uh, accompanied site visit. Um, I remember being um, slightly enraged that someone had appealed against my decision um, and uh, quite worried that, that we would lose it, um, but we didn't. Uh, so today I'm just going to use uh, some of that experience to try and helpfully help you whatever stage you're at, whatever type of appeals you're engaging with. Um, I'm going to talk around two uh, key themes, the first of which is about things to pay attention to um, and the second of which is about um, respecting the process. And then finally I'm just going to mention a few kind of um, issues that come up for me time and time again um, and things that we might go on to talk about in, in the questions. Um, so the first thing to pay attention to, um, as Elspeth said, is that the, the, the groundwork on an appeal really starts with your decision, particularly if you are headed towards a refusal, if you have an inkling that's going to get um, refused. The attention to detail in your reasons and your handling report is, is critical and will set you up for um, you know, having a good time at appeal, making it easier at appeal. Um, you need to give good, clear um, reasons for refusal, reference to policies, reference to local plans and reference the right policy and the right local plan. It is surprisingly easy to have a typo that takes you to an entirely different um, local plan policy. I have made that mistake once. Um, I hope I will never make it again because it's embarrassing to have to try and justify. And your handling report will set out all of the background, all of the site description. Um, so you really don't need to go over any of that again. Um, and like I say, a yeah, good clear decision will, will set you up nicely um, if and when an appeal does come in. When an appeal does come in, the, the next thing you need to pay attention to is dates, and that's true going through the appeal process too. Um, more and more now we are finding that there are exchange of written submissions beyond just the initial exchange. And so you've got lots of dates to keep track of um, when things are due back. Write those dates in your diary. Um, it can, as Elspeth said, it can take a couple of days for a local authority to find out about um, an appeal. And I guess that's even more so the case if you're a, if you're a third party to an appeal. Um, we don't always get notified by appellants and sometimes it can take a couple of days for the DPA to tell us about it. That goes to our admin technical team. It can take a day or two to come to me. Um, so there we go. We've lost four working days, um, which is pretty much a week. So the timescales can be can be pretty tight and it does it does take a long time to get your information together. Um, that can be particularly problematic if you are dealing with an appeal against non-determination or if you are dealing with an appeal that was against the officer's recommendation because there will be in-house procedures in your own local authority about how you need to deal with those standing orders for getting delegation to, to make submissions. Um, so you need to know what those procedures are for your own local authority um, or you need to at least know that they exist so that when you get an appeal you can go and double check um, what those procedures are. If you're not dealing with appeals very frequently or certainly we, you know we don't frequently deal with ones that are against non-determination then you might not be able to remember those but you need to know they exist so you can go and find them and factor that in to your time scale. So depending on your procedures it can be quite tight getting that information in. When you sit down to respond um, and write your response to the grounds of appeal, it should be just that, a response to the grounds of appeal. You've got a good handling report already. You don't need to go back over any of that information. So what I like to do is sit down with a printed copy because I'm old school and a pen or a highlighter and go through the um, statement of appeal and just highlight anything in there that is either factually incorrect or a misinterpretation of policy or new information that I believe has been introduced. Basically anything that irks me. Um, and then I will use that to form my response to the grounds of appeal. Now, very occasionally on a straightforward case, you might find that you've got um, nothing to add. Everything is set out there in your decision notice and your um, handling report. But normally I will find at least one or two things to correct um, or rebut and keep your response limited just to that. Um, when you finish with your red pen, the next thing to look at, and again, we touched on this already, is the um, appellant supporting documents. Because they get to go first, it's very helpful. They've had to list out um, quite often quite a lot of documents that they're relying on. Although you're on the opposite side of the argument, a lot of the documents that you would be relying on will be the same. Um, so there's no need for us um, to repeat that. We just need to add in the additional ones. 
And the final thing that I like to check is who the reporter is. Now, Scott mentioned this right back at the start of this training session about how the reporters work slightly differently from local authority planning officers. So we have a sort of hierarchy of it. It's, it's the authority's decision that we're making, whereas reporters work a little bit more independently. And so we do see a little bit more of a variance in how they will um, in, interpret things. There's a search facility on the DPA's website where you can search um, you see who your reporter is that's been allocated to the case and you can search by that reporter and see what other decisions they've got or what other cases they've been dealing with um, and I think it's always helpful if you are dealing with something that's similar it's good you know that on a exceptional release housing land policy appeal to see what the reporter you've got may have said recently on a similar case elsewhere so that's a useful thing to be able to look at um, if you can pop the next slide up for me Trevor thank you um, so respecting the process, it is a formal statutory process and it, it can seem a little bit overwhelming if it's not something that you're used to. Um, but yeah, there are set timescales. We've covered this a lot already today. Um, you know, try and stick to those. Um, and make sure that your statement is professional. It's, it's you know, we've covered this already, typos, paragraph numbers. That became particularly important to us when um, at the beginning of this year in light of MPF4 and then all the issues we've been having with assisted appeals, we ended up having to submit a number of documents to a number of different appeals that were all talking about the same issues. Um, it's very easy to have cut and paste errors in there. So, you know, be really, really careful, proofread, get somebody else to have a look at it, um, what you're what you're submitting. And please don't just respond to, to requests for information and emails. Everything that you submit, whether you're the local authority <coughs> or the third party, is going online and people will see that. Um, you know, quite often I've had uh, community councils phone me up about something that I've that has appeared on the DPA website. Um, and you think, oh gosh, they've you know they've seen it. People are looking at that. So it's really important that it's it's professional and it's formal. And it, it does, you know, as we've heard, it will help the reporter out. Um, respect the people involved in the process. Um, that's not just a reporter. Um, reporters like all of us probably don't like to be told what to do. So we would always respectfully request the reporter to do something or respectfully um, ask the reporter to consider something or to conclude something. Um, but also the case workers, they're absolutely brilliant. Um, and I, I would particularly stress that if you're a third party to an appeal and it's you're not used to dealing with the appeal process, they are exceptionally helpful um, and will you know take time to explain things to people. Um, so don't be frightened of, of contacting them. They're brilliant. Um, it is a very admin heavy process, um, as we've commented already, putting stuff on the um, through the portal is, is time consuming, it's difficult, um, but yes, respect that process, do it, makes it much easier for everybody, um, provide them on time and in the right way. I find the whole document exchange thing really difficult. Um, Elspeth said, you know, even she can work it. Um, I haven't got there yet, but I don't think you do need to be able to work it. I think you just need to have a friend that does. Um, so if in your local authority, someone else, <laughs> Elaine's nodding at me, if someone else in your local authority is the person responsible for the core documents library, you just need to be friends with them so you can ask them to put things in or to help you out um, adding, adding things on. Um, so the final thing is about kind of respecting the decision and reviewing the decision. Um, so I think it's really helpful for local authorities to go back and look at appeal decisions, think about why it might have been allowed, think about maybe what you didn't uh, manage to justify properly, what you could have said differently. Are there trends or are there themes and things that are being overturned for your local authority? Is there something you need to, to look at again, a policy you need to look at again, or a, a way of wording something that you need to think about? Um, also look at conditions that reporters put on. Um, we've actually reworded quite a few of our conditions in light of the way that reporters word conditions. Um, so that, that can be helpful. But it's not just in cases that are allowed. Um, I had a case recently that was refused where the reporter gave quite a lot of weight to um, a consideration that we had not really attached much weight to. Um, and I expect that to be a resubmission shortly. And obviously that's gonna be something to reflect on when we're redetermining that application. Um, so finally, um, and my last slide is just about some of the issues that I find that, that come up from time to time. And, um, they're kind of rhetorical questions. They're not things that I'm going to be able to fix. Um, the PARF, um, the Planning Appeal Response Form, I find um, really annoying. Um, I don't quite understand, um, and I did raise this with the DP in advance, so I'm not, I'm not just being mean. Um, there's 
all of the information that we put on the PARF already exists in Uniform, and I think most local authorities are, are using Uniform, or it's already available elsewhere, and there has to be a better way for us to get that information that we have in our system already into a form that we give to the GPA or into directly into the GPA system. So something to look at in the future, There's there's got to be a better way than for me to have to sit down and type that information into a, a PDF. Um, the second thing is about transparency. Um, I have a current case and an involvement with them, um, with community councils, with third party groups, with objectors and how the whole thing looks to people outside of this appellant local authority DPA bubble. I have a, a current case that is actually not very far away from my signboard of 20 odd years ago. Um, there are two applications there. They were Appeal, the, the appeals were submitted against non-determination, so we had not um, reached a conclusion on them, um, which was one of the things that irked me because um, it came a little bit out of the blue. We were still dealing with the application um, when they appealed. Um, so they were they were both appealed. They were both dismissed on appeal. Those decisions were then quashed after a judicial review. They are now being redetermined by the DPA, um, but in that time, um, since the new reporters have been appointed, they have been sisted twice as part of the, the wider issues that we're having with housing land supply issues um, and uh, the, the Moss End decision. So that's really difficult for me to follow. That's a lot of stages that those cases have gone through. Um, and I think as a, as a third party, you know, if you commented on that planning application, um, almost three years ago, because it's been two years since I, I checked back and the, the, the PARF was submitted in uh, two years ago. Um, it's really difficult. I don't know how a member of the public, how a third party is, it keeps on track of what's what's happening there. Which brings me to my final point, which is about timescales and not just timescales for decisions, although I think local authorities might, you know, could have a lot to say about that. Um, but the amount of time that goes into these appeals, um, Sometimes you don't have very many, sometimes they're, you know, you get one or two and they're straightforward, but particularly at West Lothian, we've been inundated with some fairly significant complex housing land supply appeals um, that have had a huge impact on our workload. We don't get a, a fee for dealing with um, appeals and we're not um, in the... I think it was Scott mentioned at the beginning that um, you have reporters who you can just kind of pick up when work is busy. Local authority planning departments don't really work like that. Um, so it's it's quite difficult for us to respond to a big bubble of work like that. It, it's calm at the minute, but um, I think when the when there's a decision on the Moss End appeal, then there's all these applications. I think, Scott, did you say you had 18? I think we must have about half of those, um, must be in West Lothian, that will all come out of CIST and then we'll have to go back into this process um, of, of further written submissions or further procedures. Um, so, Sorry, some of that is repetition after me telling you don't repeat things, um, but hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight as to how it's done from this side of things.